This is a conversation with Ben Johnson. He's a chess educator, professional chess player, and currently the host of the very popular Perpetual Chess podcast. In this conversation, we discuss whether chess is an art form, whether it's a silly little game, whether it's a sport, or whether it's science. We discuss the links between intelligence and chess. We talk about the psychological impact of chess, and we also discuss artificial intelligence. This is no time. If you like what you see, then do hit subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify, or rate five stars on Apple Podcasts. If this project was a rocket, then your love and support would be the fuel. And if this project was a Tesla, then your love and support would be the battery. If you want me to stop making these stupid comparisons, then you can make a donation on Patreon, Instagram, Anchor. Pick your poison. If not through monetary channels, then do consider sharing these episodes. I cannot stress enough. how much of an impact your shares have for the forms of love and support you can follow this channel on instagram or twitter or follow me personally i know i'm going to make an offer you can refuse it's no time in the movie searching for bobby fisher ben kingsley asked the question what is chess do you think those who play for fun or not at all dismiss it as a game The ones who devote their lives to it for the most part insist that it's a science. It's neither. Bobby Fischer got underneath it like no one before and found at its center art. My first question for you, my opening move, Ben Johnson, is the same question that Ben Kingsley asks. What is chess, do you think? Is it just a silly little game? Is it science or is it art? Well, I would probably cop out and say it's a little bit of everything. By the <laughs> by the way, I should say I'm happy to be here and I interview tons of chess professionals and uh, more than ever a lot of them call it a sport and yeah. I do think it does have more sporting dynamics. Like there are artistic elements in terms of like unexpected moves that you might see or um creative patterns, but above uh, above all else, it's a cutthroat competition. So I think some people get hung up on the definition of sport being like a physical activity. It is just as grueling as golf or something, I can tell you that. I'm not one to die on the hill of whether or not it's a sport, but out of those three things plus sport, I would say it most closely resembles a sport at least when played at the top levels. Okay. So you have taken the stance as a mixture of all, but if you had to make pick a side, it would be a sport. Yes. Right. Let's try to make a case for each. Okay. And for our openings, I'm going to try and make a case that chess is an art form. Okay. Gary Kasparov, a gentleman you might have heard of. Oh, yes. <laughs> name rings a bell. The <laughs> name rings a bell. In a recent interview, he said that in the games that I played later in my career, I was not motivated by either winning or losing, but by the desire to create something new. Right. The desire to create something new like an artist, which is an interesting statement from Kasparov who you can really argue showed the science behind the game or showed really the sport or the strategy behind the game given his longevity given his preparation uh, his focus on or his emphasis on focus and endurance as well but you can equally make the statement that Gary Kasparov showed the art in chess given his innovations and in openings in particular if i were to make this extremely bold statement that Gary Kasparov was not a chess player was not a sports player or a sports athlete but rather was an artist and chess just happened to be the medium through which he expresses art would you agree with the statement it wouldn't again it wouldn't be my <laughs> first choice of words yeah. but i will say what what you say rings true because vladimir kramnik another former world champion actually the guy who toppled kasparov somewhat surprisingly did the exact same thing in sort of his the twilight years of his professional yeah. and actually people didn't know until afterwards when he announced his retirement that he was playing this very sort of swashbuckling chess it seemed like he was sacrificing um not in the chess sense sacrificing but sacrificing uh looking for the best move for looking to play play creative games yeah. so there is that element but when kramnik did that his results were optimized so the thing is chess at the end of the day again it's a competition there's two people involved so you can try your best to create something beautiful but if the circumstances don't um don't support it then it's sort of um it it would probably it would often backfire so kasparov when he played um at least you know through his prime 
was trying to optimize his results every time. So it's nice that it, towards the end, he tried to create something beautiful, yeah. but that wasn't chess in the purest sense and in, in, in the professional chess in the purest sense. Um, now there is something called chess study composition where you make a puzzle um, from scratch and you try to illustrate an idea. And to me, that's kind of the most artistic form of chess because you can say, wouldn't it be cool, you know, if when the pawn promotes, instead of turning it into a queen or even a knight, which is the second most, it's much less common than a queen, but every once in a while, if you promote to a knight, you're checking the king since it moves in a nonlinear way, the knight in an L shape. Um, so what do you mean by promote? Uh, when a pawn reaches the other side it. and yeah, it yeah. turns into another piece. Yep. Like 98% of the time, a professional is going to choose a queen. queen. Yeah. 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 But maybe 2% of the time, it's going to choose a knight. And almost never are the other pieces the best choices. But when people compose endgame studies yeah. where they create the position, often they're going to fathom something where yeah. you use a different piece. And there's lots of little tricks like that. So to me, the composition competitions in chess can resemble art and there could be artistic moves that might hit you the same way a beautiful painting does. But if you go out of your way to create art, it's going to hurt your chances of winning, at least if you're playing a professional. So Kremnik decided to bring out the art in chess where it affected his results. In that case, I would put forward the question, how important are the results? Because if you step back from the game, at the end of the day, these numbers, the tournaments and the titles, of course they matter, but after a point, do they really matter? What we really ought to see in any sport is something beautiful, something sublime, something that will stay with you for years after. So can you make the argument that maybe the beauty is something that we should be achieve, look to achieve more than just the titles or the results? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good point, especially depending on what the exact competition is. I mean, of course, the, the world championship match itself has this rich legacy and chess players take it super seriously. So if it were something like that, it would be frowned upon if someone uh, showed up and just said, you know what, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to win. But what I really want to do is show you something cool, like even though it would be cool that that would not be encouraged. But uh, these top professionals play tons of tournaments and someone like Kramnik and Kasparov, they've made a lot of money. They've um, established a lot of notoriety. So if in one tournament that's not that different than the other, you know, say 10 tournaments a year they play, they they go for creativity rather than peak performance. To me, sure, like that, that will add to their legacy just as much as like one more trophy on their mantle would. Do you think that there needs to be a realignment of priorities in that case? Because to me, I think the point of sport first and foremost was to get creativity, get the beauty in humans out. And then the results can follow. Like the results should be a byproduct of who is the most creative or the most beautiful player, the most sublime player. And then the tournaments should maybe reflect that. But it feels like now if you, if you have to make a choice between either getting the results or playing the most innovative game or the most exciting game, then I feel like we have somewhere lost the line. It's not just chess. I think every yeah. sport in general. Yeah, I agree. I feel like you're swimming upstream there. I mean, <laughs> I don't disagree with you, but like yeah. what gets people coming back is the element of competition and the idea of winning. Like I myself am a sports fan. And like, if, uh, you know, if Joel Embiid, I'm a 76ers fan, if he hits a really cool shot, but the Sixers lose, uh, I'm going to be disappointed, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. so I think that your view might be more refined, but I don't think it's going to be widely adopted. It's a more idealistic view. I'll definitely, <laughs> yeah. I'll definitely agree. Maybe not practical, but I would love it if every sport, uh, would focus on the beauty. You mentioned Kremnik playing a more beautiful or let's say a more innovative style of chess later in his career. Is there a name that jumps to your mind that was the most accurate representation of a chess artist? And usually in any game, whether it's baseball, football, soccer, the most graceful player is not always the best player or the most impactful player. They've not won the most titles. Is there one name that jumps to your mind that when you watch them play chess, you're just taken aback by how graceful they are, how artistic they are. And it's just a sublime experience. For sure. Uh, I think if you ask a lot of chess players, I'd say probably five out of 10 or something like that, which is a high percentage more than any other person. They're going to name Mikhail Tal, who of course okay. was a, a world champion. Um, they, they called him uh, the magician from Riga. Uh, he was from Riga, Latvia, from Soviet era. He lived a sort of um, very... Um, very freestyling life. He, he drank a lot, uh, you know, um, 
was in a lot of relationships with women and over, over the board, um, he was just incredibly creative, but he also emphasized the psychological side. Um, so these days, of course, with chess computers, which we'll probably talk about, you can compare different world champions across eras and see how their moves stack up to what we now know are, at least by current standards, the best moves. Um, and his games do not stack up quite as well as some other world champions because he was much more invested in putting your opponents under pressure, which also often involved these sort of creative moves. So he stands out. And of course, he was at his peak in like the 1960s and 1970s. Um, but the other person who would get named a lot is Paul Morphy, who you have to go way back. You know, we're talking like 1860s. So chess evolved a lot. Uh, in those, in is that the time of Manny Lasker as well, or uh, it was before oh. Morphy came even before, Lasker, before Lasker. Yeah, okay. He was uh, preceded there even being a world champion. Um, so he also was an extremely creative player, but it's harder to judge back then because he was leaps and bounds ahead of his competition. Whereas by the time Tall came along, there were tons of fantastic players that he was putting to the test. Many interesting things from that when you spoke about the psychological connections between his personality, how he was off the yeah. board and within the board. We'll definitely jump to that. Let's, okay. So we try to make the case for chess as an art form. I feel like I'm trying to, so I've tried to structure this interview like a chess game. So there's okay. three phases. There's openings, a middle game and an end game. Okay. And every time you make a move, I'm trying to give you a counter move and try to play devil's advocate. But I must say you are navigating them pretty skillfully <laughs> so far. Hopefully we'll read somewhere beautiful at the end of it. So let's move into the middle game. And let's try to make the case for chess as a science, as a sport, um, as a game. And let's start with intelligence and then we can move to psychology, which you brought up. Okay. Let's start with another quote from Gary Kasparov. He's dominating the conversation today. He said once that excelling at chess has long been considered a symbol of more general intelligence. That is an incorrect assumption in my view, as pleasant as it might be. So let's set the premise. Do you agree with Kasparov? Do you think intelligence in chess translates to intelligence in life? Or do you disagree because analytical skills, forecasting, deduction, game theory, calculating lines, all of these skills that you hone in chess are transferable and can be applied in real life? Yeah, this, this is a, a really interesting question. And I think where Kasparov is coming, so I should say I mostly disagree. Um, so, but I think where he's coming from is people tend to automatically assume that uh, chess players are smart and that they're good at lots of things. Yeah. And that's not necessarily true, but I, I've interviewed a uh, cognitive science, Dr. Christopher Chabri, who did this famous uh, experiment that you might've even seen on YouTube called the invisible gorilla, mm -hmm. um, where uh, there's a bunch of kids playing basketball and a gorilla kind of walks across the court yep. and people don't even notice, like half the people don't notice the gorilla. Um, and he's also a chess master and I've interviewed him a few times and he's one of the people that mentioned that they have done studies on the correlation between uh, intelligence and chess skill and that the correlation is small, but it exists. So okay. that's sort of my tentpole <laughs> on the question. That's what I, that's who I defer to in the information that I, that I Refer to, and that's sort of been my experience. I mean, I've interviewed so many um, incredibly strong chess players, you know, former world champions and world class players, and they're they're a smart bunch. You know, a lot of them speak seven, eight languages. A lot of them have these like you know side hobbies, doing like advanced math. Um, so I think if you apply it universally, you're gonna the difference is small enough that I'm sure there are chess like grandmasters who don't have above average IQs, like they probably exist, but um, the correlation overall is present. So you've disagreed with Kasparov. He's watching. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I'll wait to get his email uh, uh -huh. about this, but okay. So the general stance is that there is a correlation between general intelligence and intelligence in chess. Yeah. Like a narrow domain based intelligence. But so, a small correlation. Yeah. A small correlation, but Anecdotally as well, the grandmasters you've interviewed, they all seem to be a smart bunch. And people who do play chess, even when you interact with them, they, they seem like a smart bunch. Like they seem intelligent. Yeah, right? I mean, maybe not so worldly, you know, but, right. sm but smart. Right. <laughs> okay, so if that is the stance, I'm going to now try to push you on this. Okay. If we consider all the systems in the world, then the reigning, defending, undisputed best chess players in the world are the chess engines. Yes whether it's Stockfish or whether it's Deep Blue, which is like a brute force calculator, or whether it's AlphaGo, 
which is reinforcement learning and historical database, would you go as far as saying because they're intelligent in chess, they are also intelligent systems in general? Would you put them on par with another human? Yeah, it's interesting. And there is a big difference between what you mentioned, sort of the brute force engines like Stockfish, where the humans are giving it the inputs and then they're basically like calculators trying to see as far as they can yeah. versus the self-taught ones like AlphaZero that Google invented. And now there's an open source free one called Leela Zero that a lot of the top players are using. Mm -hmm. And those to me, those that's seriously impressive. And that's the one that has like a lot more implications for domains beyond chess. The fact that these machines are learning to think. Um, so, so yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're going to take over <laughs> the world any day now. Would you call them intelligent systems in general? Are they equal to a human? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not an AI expert, but it seems to be moving in that direction. Would you say Stockfish is as smart as any other human being out there? And I don't mean in chess. Yeah. In life in general. Yeah. Stockfish to me is not, it is not the best example. Again, it's the neural networks because Stockfish, it's more like a calculator, you know? Right. So um, to me, that's not as scary as uh, AlphaGo, the one designed by Google, that they just taught it the rules of chess and left it to play against itself. And it played a million, you know, millions of games against itself and figured out its own guidelines for the game and mm -hmm. became leaps and bounds better than Magnus Carlsen just by playing against itself and figuring out what yeah. worked. So to me, that's the one that has like uh, broader implications. And yeah, I mean, you could say in this narrow domain, it's smarter than humans. We have an intriguing premise here. So we established that if you are good at chess, then in most cases, there's a small correlation among humans that mm -hmm. you're generally intelligent in life. But if you're a system like Stockfish and you're good at chess, that doesn't necessarily translate to you being an intelligent system in life in general, other right. walks of life. So I guess you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. I'm going to throw another layer into the discussion. Bobby Fischer once said that in the game of chess, I may be a winner, but in the game of life, I was always a loser, implying that he had devoted so much of his time to chess that other aspects of his life took a backseat. I'm going to now compare grandmasters to a stock engine. Both the stock engine and the grandmaster, they, you can argue, have spent their entire life studying chess, analyzing chess, reading chess books, and pretty much, I mean, sure, they're good at other things, but like chess is the one area where they really excel at. Would you then extend the statement that you made for Stockfish and would you extend it to grandmasters and say that they are also just narrowly intelligent and not intelligent in general? Uh, you certainly come across yeah. that type of person. I wouldn't say it's universal by yeah. any means. I mean, there's a lot of people who are quite accomplished outside of chess, and there's a lot of grandmasters who end up pursuing and achieving great things uh, in other domains. But you do certainly, again, you do come across people. And uh, Fisher, I mean, he was a unique example. I mean, obviously he had uh, mental health issues that came to the fore and uh, unfortunate um, uh, misogyny and anti-Semitism that he became yeah. known for. Um, so yeah, he's, he's obviously not the best uh, example for chess, but you do, you do come across chess players who don't have that sort of worldly um, knowledge across domains. And, and one other thing I wanted to add about the question of intelligence and chess is in terms of like what intelligence is, it's really, I'm speaking strictly about the correlation between IQ and uh, like how, what you would score on an IQ test and chess ability. Like, so what good is an IQ test is a separate question that I'm not really answering, you know? So and that's not to say that you're, you're going to be amazing at a bunch of things in the world, but it is to say that um, broadly, if you took a slice of grandmasters and gave them an IQ test, they would score above like a random sampling of people on the street. Yes, that's right. At what point would you draw the line? So a grandmaster who's only studied chess the entire life and only good at chess and a stock engine who's only studied chess and is only good at chess. At what point do you start drawing the line that a grandmaster is more generally intelligent compared to this chess engine? What if they can crack a joke? What if there's, what if Stockfish has the ability to make you laugh tomorrow? Would you then classify as generally intelligent? What if it has a sense of identity, consciousness, can contemplate the universe? At what point would you start drawing the line? Yeah, I think we'll find out in the next like 50 <laughs> years. Um, but but yeah, I mean, the, the machines are doing impressive things. So uh, Well, currently, Chad GPD, I think, can play chess and can crack a joke and has a sense of identity yeah. and can think about the universe. Would you then say that it's intelligent? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid so, yeah. <laughs> and it's all developing so quickly. I mean, we didn't yeah. even, you know, Chad GPT was not like... 
it might have existed in a lab a year ago, but no one knew about it. You know, it's brand new. Yeah, it is an exciting time. And I just love to track, but I'm sure this is what they said about Deep Blue back in the 80s. And then it. Yeah, it was, I don't know. I feel like yeah. this is even a bigger paradigm shift potentially. Let's see how it works out. You mentioned Bobby Fischer and how uh, certain problems arose later in his career. Do you think? Do you think it was chess that broke him? Do you think chess is such a grueling sport that you have to dive so deep mentally, especially at the time when he did it, when there were no engines as well and barely any literature on chess that he had to really go and invent it in a way? Do you think that's what broke him or is it something else altogether? Yeah, that's that's a fascinating question. And I've been lucky enough to interview some of the most uh, prominent uh, Bobby Fischer biographers, Frank Beatty, who wrote Profile of a Prodigy and Endgame and uh, International Master John Donaldson. Uh, who's written a couple biographies. And all we can say for sure is that there were certainly some preconditions for um, some difficulties for Fisher. There was a history of mental illness in his family. He also had a pretty difficult childhood. I mean, he grew up without much money, um, without a father figure in his life, and was pretty much left to to fend for himself. Um, his mom, by most accounts, meant well, but she um she wasn't around that much and chess became sort of like his family. I mean, yeah. he ended up making some friends within the New York City mm-hmm. chess community. Um, but he he didn't necessarily have a solid support network and chess became kind of like his social escape in in addition to uh the game that that he excelled at. So um it's a tough one to parse, but I I would say that um the conditions for mental health struggles were were already there. Um, and chess may have accelerated them, but they may have not because um, he was extent, he was con- when he became world champion and then refused to defend his title because they couldn't come to an agreement on the conditions of the match. Um, he was considered eccentric, but he only went off the deep end when he wasn't playing chess. So, you know, there's, there's a famous <laughs> saying like, does, does chess keep, um, I'm probably going to butcher this, but does chess, uh, turn, uh, does it keep crazy people sane or make sane people crazy? Some, something like that. And that's sort of the question that it gets down to what's your answer with, with Fisher. I think, (laughs) I think (laughs) this is a cop out, but I think it's a case by case basis. But with, you do see people who, um, and some people have speculated that Fisher was on the spectrum. Um, I've, I asked Frank Brady about that uh, when I got to interview him, and he said that the, there wasn't much evidence to support that. But you have seen people um, who, who might be on the spectrum for whom chess seems to be a uh, productive activity, a good, a good place to apply their intellect. Um, and there, there were elements of Fisher's personality where he was quite obsessive and uh, singularly focused, where, like, I mean, anecdotally, certainly, if you look at it, when he was playing competitive chess, again, he was eccentric, but not crazy. And then later he went, air quotes, crazy. We are diving, I think we are diving to the waters of psychology and I, I would love to get into it. So let me ask you a final question about intelligence and then we'll come back to okay. psychology and we can close the book on intelligence. While we're talking about Fisher, Fisher did launch Fisher Random Chess, so Chess 960. And... Much later in his life, he became a strong critic, a detractor of classical chess. He used to say that opening theory has ruined the game completely. It's taking the creativity out of it and it's removing pure chess in quotes. And he, his argument was that now modern chess relies on how well you've studied your openings, how well you've studied with the chess engine, how many people you have on your team. And as a result, the battle of wits is being replaced by a battle of memory in a way. I do think there's some merit to his argument because at a very high level professional chess now to me, it feels like it's not a, it's not necessarily a battle of wits, but it's more of a battle of who can make the least mistakes because most games always end towards a draw and midway through, you can tell that this is going towards a draw because all these moves have already been played out so many different times. So there is some merit to that. To eliminate that advantage of openings, he launched Fisher Random Chess. So in fact, for people who don't know, what is Fisher Random Chess or Chess 960? And then as a follow-up, do you think it is a more accurate representation of pure chess in quotes? Yeah, so these are good questions. So chess, it's now being more commonly called Chess 960, although he did patent it as Fisher Random Chess when he invented it. So the idea is instead of the pieces starting on designated squares, you use sort of a random uh, number generator 
to give uh, to start the, the back row pieces. The pawns stay on the second row for white and black, but the back row pieces um, go in different positions. And apparently there's 960 different permutations, hence chess 960. And Fisher was definitely ahead of the curve in that regard. I mean, you do hear increasing, com the complaints have been kind of gathering volume for a 50 year span. Like even someone like Capablanca foresaw, who preceded Fisher, foresaw that uh, chess was trending towards a draw and that ultimately the rules might be need to be changed. Um, but it, it's it's definitely an issue, especially at the professional level, I would say, because, yeah, I mean, when these thirty five hundred level. So these are these are machines that are like, you know, um, Magnus, if they played 100 games, the best player in the world would not win a game against them. Just zero chance because it's a computer. We can say zero chance. He might draw one or two games but that's about it. But when they play each other, more than 90% of the games are, are going to be draws. Um, so sooner or later, something needs to be done to um, make the, I mean, most people don't find draws as entertaining. I, I personally don't. Um, so there's that element of making chess more entertaining. But as you say, there's also the element of just it turning into a memorization contest. Yeah. And I do think Fisher was onto something. The one thing I would uh, caveat that with is we're talking about the professional level. Like I'm I'm a master level player. I'm what's called a USCF master, which is like way worse than a grandmaster, but it means you're you're pretty decent. It's yep. like being like a, a minor league uh, athlete or something mm -hmm. like that, a low level one at that. But at my level, there's no need for uh, for chess 960. Like we make plenty of mistakes in our games. <laughs> um, it's only really at the elite level where I do think it might be an issue. And when you interview these guys, like... Uh, and, and women like uh, Magnus Carlsen or Yuta Pogar or Hikaru Nakamura or whoever it might be, they do feel an affinity for it because um, A, uh, it, it leads to more interesting positions for them, but B, just like from a maintenance perspective, like Magnus dropped out of the world championship cycle. Um, and I th a lot of people think part of that is just like the sheer amount of work he had to put in just memorizing moves when he knows he's the best player, but he has to learn all these lines. So yeah, I mean, to, to make a long answer short, for sure was on to something. We love long answers. Okay. Keep it as long as possible. Okay. Right. So um, that's pretty interesting. So Magnus probably, like, memorization took the joy out of chess for him. Probably. At least at least when it comes to the world championship cycle, because they yeah. do them every two years and you spend months ramping up for it. Um, so I think... Uh, it's conjecture because he hasn't given his reasons that much, but he's been vocally against the current format of the world championship yeah. um, for even since before he won it, uh, like back, dating back to 2012. Now there are different solutions and Magnus's preferred solution to uh, the fact that so many games are draws and that you have to memorize so many moves is he just wants to play faster games because he says, look, if you, instead of giving each player a total of um, three hours to play a game. If you give them, I mean, 30 minutes, they will make mistakes. And yes, you still need to know, you still need to memorize a bunch of moves. But if you want to getting back to our, our conversation about art, if you want to try something more experimental, try a move that you know the computer says isn't as good, but you want to try to catch your opponent off guard. If you do that in a game where your opponent has three hours to figure out and often They've memorized enough where if you try something new, they'll know it's not supposed to be good, but they just don't won't know why. Right. Um, and if they know it's not supposed to be good and they have time to figure it out, yeah. they'll figure it out. Got it. But if they only have a little bit of time, even if they know it's not supposed to be good, eventually you have to move. So that's why Magnus has been much more interested in defending or re-engaging in the world championship match if they make it a fast match, a faster match. But there's a lot of purists that have been following these slow matches. They used to go on for months. Now the one that's about to start as we record here on April 7th um, is um, going on. It's 14 games over about 20, 25 days. Mm -hmm. So still a long time, but not as long as it used to be. But there's a lot of purists who love that element, even though the opening preparation um, takes a higher and higher role in it compared to the even, you know, 30 years ago. Chess is at an interesting crossroads. I did watch that interview of Magnus where he spoke about dropping out of the world yeah. championship. It's an interesting crossroads that the best, well, we can debate that, but the best chess player in the world wants chess to be more exciting and wants, wants to change the format because he believes inherently that 
the world championship doesn't current the format current bring out the best chess player even though it's him yeah he wants to be challenged more and he wants there to be a much fairer competition i think it's a very interesting place for the sport to be and there's something that's going to come out because he's probably the most popular player as well oh for sure and, and if he's not playing the world championship there's always going to be that cloud hanging over the person who wins it saying that they never beat Magnus. Yeah, but one thing to add about that is there are people who say that he is serving his self-interest because even though he's defended his title um, successfully since 2013, um, people consider him an even bigger favorite in faster time controls. So Got he's it. really good at rapid chess, which is when you have 30 minutes, and blitz chess, which yeah. is when you have five minutes. And Magnus advocates for what's called a mixed format, where there would be some five-minute, some 30-minute, and some classical two to three hour chess. And he says, look, we can count the classical chess higher. We can give that a heavier weighting, but he wants it to be like a mixed format um, where all, all formats. So he does, people do say that part of the reason that he is self-interested because he's even better at those other games. I personally don't agree. I feel like he's proven himself at the classical level, even though in the last two, uh, well, not the last one, but the preceding two world championship matches against uh, Sergei Karyak and then Fabiano Caruana, both of them were tied after the classical portion. So they played 12 or 14 games yeah. and uh, the matches were tied. And then they went to faster games and Magnus beat them in the faster games. Mm -hmm. And the most recent match he won um, in the, the classical portion against uh, Nepomnici. But um, in any event, he's we have a huge sample to show that he's the best classical player. It's called a rating, you know, like... Um, it's the rating system is, is quite accurate at the top level. So people criticize Magnus for serving his interests, but in my opinion, it's, it's not well-founded. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, this is a very interesting point where the sport is reached and I would love to see where it goes from here, honestly, <laughs> because it's not many people at the top of the sports often asked to change the entire format. Right. And as someone who studied Magnus so much. I would agree with you as well. That I do get the feeling that he wants to be challenged a bit more where he's reached, he reached a point where he feels a bit stagnated yeah. at least at the world championship. And that's why he's setting personal goals of just wanting to reach a rating of 2,800 or 29. Yeah. 29, sorry, 2,900. Yeah. So it seems interesting that he's now setting his own goals because the world championship itself is not exciting. Yeah. So that's a very interesting point. We were talking about Fisher random chess. You did concede that probably at a very high level at a grandmaster level, it is, it might be the step forward, at least any level below that classical chess still has merit to it. So I just, just so I get it right, let's do a thought experiment. So you have two people who are equally intelligent, measured by the same test, and they both know how to play chess, but one person knows openings, one person doesn't know openings. If they both play chess, the person who knows openings is more likely to win. Uh, you? Yeah, for sure. For sure. But if they were both to play fish or random chess, then you would assume that the game is a lot more competitive because the advantage that openings gives you is completely neutralized. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's okay. accurate. And, and you get the feeling that maybe 10 years down the line, at least at a higher level, Fisher random chess might be. The yeah. Kind I, of I'm hesitant to put a timeline on it because people have been predicting the demise of regular <laughs> chess for, yeah. for a very long time, but, but does something need to happen. What's up? Does something need to happen? Um, I'm more on Magnus's side where I think, I like his idea of speeding up the world championship and mixing the time control. And to me right now, that would be sufficient because okay. what Magnus has pointed out is that if you do that, it enables you to play a lot more games Yeah. because as it is, every game is taking five, six hours. So if you say, okay, we're going to get the two best players together, they can play a series of games over a month. If they're playing classical games, the sample is still going to be quite small. A Magnus did a, a well-known interview with uh, Lex Friedman uh, where he made a good point about in, in low scoring sports, um, the variance is higher. So something like soccer or hockey. Um, and he put chess in this category where there are not a lot of goals or points scored. Um, the variance is going to be higher. And chess, he's referring to scoring as winning a game. Mm -hmm. So he's saying the variance is extremely high, even in a 14-game match, yeah. because 80% of the games are likely to be draws right off the bat, and maybe 100% out of those 14. So what he wants is faster games, and it's counterintuitive that faster games, which might seem more random, there's actually less variance because overall you're playing a lot more moves. Yeah. So yes, you might make one very uncharacteristic sort of brain fart in one game, mm -hmm. but if you're able to play, say, instead of um, – that same day where you were going to play one classical game, you can play four rapid games or you can play, you know, 
12 blitz games. So that's where I think that should be the next step before Fisher random. But I also always say on perpetual chess on my podcast, like you really need to ask the top players. I mean, it's great. I have, I consider I'm first and foremost, a chess fan and I have my opinions, but uh, the fact that the world champion is not incentivized to defend his title and Fabiano Caruana, who played him in 2018 recently said that he also prefers these faster games, even though he doesn't consider it his best form personally. Um, so I think you've got to, you've got to confer with them. And, um, but I would love to see something like what Magnus envisions of a mix of game speeds. But I'm telling you, every time I say that on the podcast, I get like, you know, tons of emails from people who love things the way they are. So I'm going to get a lot of hate mail. Right, exactly. Thank you, Ben. Firstly, <laughs> Gary Kasparov is sending the right, right. email as you speak. Yeah, well, tell, <laughs> no. him to, tell him to come on Perpetual Chess when you, when you hear from him. You know, if I was in Gary's inner circles, I would ask him to come on my <laughs> right. well, But yeah, We'll make it happen. Okay. Maybe we can provoke him into coming exactly. and clarifying his point. Let's talk about psychology. Um, we have been floating around the psychology in chess, so let's finally address it in our middle game. Let's start with the simple premise. Let's, let's do another thought experiment. Let's say, you know, every single thing about a person, you know, their likes, dislikes, their traumas, fears, you know, their approach in other games in life, how much of their real life personality will be a direct reflection of their chess playing style. If you had all the information in the world available about that person. Would you be able to construct their chess personality and construct a strategy that can defeat them? Yeah, I don't know how much correlation there is. I mean, one thing I would say that I've observed is that chess players writ large seem to skew towards being introverts. So that <laughs> that makes it that yeah. already sort of tilts the scale. Yeah. Because if you're someone who spent a lot of time studying chess, you've spent a lot of time invariably like alone in a room. You know, with it, books and, yeah, yeah, it might be with a book and oh. these days it's with a computer, yeah. but you're not around a lot of other people. And that's something that you're comfortable with. You know, there's no one who gets to be amazing at chess, like just rolling out of bed. You know, like a lot of people, the Queen's Gambit, of course, famously popular show that was and they really did do a fantastic job. But that was one common criticism was like the way it was portrayed is, yes, you can have like off the charts acumen at chess, but no matter who you are, you're going to be studying so much. Um, and, or, or playing, but you're going to be engaged in chess so much. And they didn't necessarily depict the years of struggle that it generally takes. Um, so remind me your, your question again. My question is if you have all the information about a person and you know exactly who they are in terms yeah. of their real life personality, can yeah. you construct the yeah. chess? I haven't part? noticed much correlation between chess okay. playing style and, uh, and personality. So they decouple personalities. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some like of, as far as chess players go more outgoing, people might play cautiously and, uh, and some, um, more quiet people might play aggressively. Um, so the aforementioned Mikhail Tal, I think was kind of the, the exception in that regard where he led this bohemian lifestyle and also played this sort of, uh, um, carefree chess style, but that's not always the case. Have you noticed that in yourself as well? Do you get the feeling that it's two different bends? one Ben who goes out there in the real world and interacts with everyone. And there's a different Ben who plays chess. Yeah. I mean, the way I play chess, I'm a dad now and I feel like I've gotten more cautious in life as life has gone on. Yeah. And I have also gotten a little more cautious in chess, probably to the detriment of my chess ability. Um, but overall, like when I was at my best in chess, I was definitely an introvert, definitely on the quiet side. Um, and I played pretty aggressive as a chess player. So yeah, again, no, no real mix there. Very interesting. So it's like chess brings out a part of your personality that probably you would not bring out in any other aspect of life. Like I noticed as well, like I was the closest I can define is like the road rage personality. Right. right? Yeah. It's like when I used to play chess, like in general, I'm not the type of person who would show a lot of anger, but in chess, I would be right. completely frustrated, screaming, trying to break the laptop. Yeah. Because <laughs> mostly I would be losing. But, right. <laughs> but yeah, there was like, I did notice that I was a completely different person who used to play chess, more extreme version. And I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, unless you've done some research into this. Yeah, I haven't. But yeah, it does bring out uh, unique personality traits. So let's talk about what your chess personality should look like since they are decoupled. And I'm going to bring another Kasparov quote and this was he said in his Lex Friedman interview as well where he said that he always believed that whenever he lost a match it was because he made a mistake and not because his opponent was better than him and he admitted in the interview that this is a very arrogant belief but he said that if he didn't believe that 
then he would never be able to push himself to get better because the day he resigns in the fact that the opponent's much better than me, it's a very defeating conclusion for him. This is an unhealthy trait to be arrogant, uh, to be obsessed with the game. But do you think chess needs that? And we spoke about chess breaking Bobby Fischer as well. Do you think because it's such a tough sport, you need to have some unhealthy traits, obsession, stubbornness, arrogance, to be able to push past that pain and reach the top echelon? It certainly doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you absolutely have to have it, but um, it's certainly better to be overconfident as a chess player than underconfident, I would say. Um, okay. and, and you do see that trait uh, uh, across a lot of a lot of the world champions, although some of them it's not as manifest as it was with Kasparov. The, I mean, the other thing you have to say in Kasparov's defense is he was more dominant than I mean, he was one of the most dominant chess players of all time. Um, so he yeah, but it's it's. Um, yeah, there's there's a grain of truth for sure. Is this a conscious choice that you make as well? Did like, do you get the feeling that maybe what's holding you back from achieving a goal of going back to 20 to 70, a peak <laughs> rating of that? Do you think what's stopping you is that ruthlessness that you need to bring back, but that might also run the risk of bringing some, making your real life personality maybe slightly more arrogant or like slightly rude? Um, <laughs> well, it, it's nice of you to even like compare my chess game, like even mention it a sentence as, after Kasparov's because, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just an amateur who plays, plays when I can. But um, for me, the other thing about chess is like there is evidence that you peak around the age of 30. Um, and it, it's, again, somewhat counterintuitive and does sort of support the argument that it's a sport because, uh, you know, when they run tests of when perf when players perform the best, it, it correlates pretty closely to when athletes peak in, in different sports. And uh, w what I've lost in the years, yes, I've gotten more cautious, but my brain just used to be a little bit sharper. Again, to quote uh, my friend, Dr. Christopher Shabri, uh, he talks about fluid and crystallized intelligence. And obviously this is sort of well known within the, the cognitive science space, but I'm not a cognitive scientist. So I sort of draw on the people that I've interviewed. But basically the idea is that fluid intelligence is knowledge that you've acquired. And that's something that you can be great at throughout your life and you can improve at throughout your life. Some common examples are something like being a lawyer or being a fiction writer where all the knowledge that you require, you can continue to get better at it. And there's nothing inhibiting you from improving into your fifties. Um, but then there's fluid intelligence, which is basically your, your ability for your neurons to fire quickly, you know, and for that, um, it peaks around the age of 30 and in chess, you think you get this worldly wisdom and you're going to be able to outfox the kids, you know, <laughs> but it's quite unforgiving when you're competing, um, it, it's tough to make up for just playing good moves. You know, you can read all the books you want. You can be able to cite all the principles that you want, but the end, at the end of the day, it's a competition and the clock is ticking and you've got to make choices better than your opponent. And what I've found I'm 46 is that it's harder than it used to be, you know, and, and I don't expect that to change as the years go on. Wow. So you, if you're on the wrong side of the cognitive decline, then becoming a grandmaster becomes more and more an impossibility. Ooh, yeah you if you out. don't make yeah. grandmaster by the age of i don't think anyone's ever they they do this thing where if you win the world senior championship yeah. they automatically confer the title um but to actually earn the grandmaster title the traditional way i don't believe anyone's done it over the age of 45 wow that's yeah and, if, fascinating. and there's yeah. been about 2000 in human history so and, and i might be forgetting one or two people but i don't think i am yeah that's very fascinating yeah and it comes up a lot in my podcast because mm -hmm. we have a lot of, I interview both amateurs and professionals who still want to get better and they put in tons of hours. Um, but, and I don't think it's necessarily like the, the less, the lower you go on the chess skill um, ladder, the more you can still achieve because you're not hitting up against this sort of um, inherent ceiling as soon because like the mistakes that you have to learn to avoid are not as advanced, you know? Yeah. So I do think you can still get better as an adult, but the, yeah. the better you are at a given point, the harder it is to improve past a certain age. Interesting. Depressing and interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in one of your episodes itself at Perpetual Chess, you had mentioned this about the, about the cap or the age cap of 30 years. And you had said something interesting where you said that at this age, you know what's the right move. You have a gut instinct for it because you've studied so many games, you've studied so many players. 
But even after knowing what's right or what's not right, you can't get yourself to play the right move. And I found that to be very interesting. This is a feeling I'm not experienced. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, because there's the the trust but verify thing. So you might have an instinct, but especially yeah. if it involves a sacrifice, which is where you give up a piece on purpose um, with the hopes that you'll get something bigger in return. Often it can be to open up lines to your opponent's king um, or it often has to do with your opponent's king, but sometimes it might even be to like just get your piece on a certain square. Um, and when you sacrifice, you're hoping to get these things. But as you get older, you that's the sort of thing where you become more cautious and you want proof, you know. But in reality, so you might try to to do what's called calculating, where you look ahead and you try to see concretely, like if I give up this bishop, then I know that I'm going to checkmate the king. Maybe it's in ten moves, but sometimes you can't see far enough and you just have to trust your instinct. And that's something where when you get older, I think it becomes harder to, um, it becomes harder to play sort of, um, intuitively and just sort of let it flow. Um, at least if you're not like a professional who's competing all the time. Yeah. That's a, maybe a frustrating feeling where you know that there's something off, but you're not able to make that, uh, that calculation, you're not able to calculate the lines yeah. and find out why it's wrong, but you just know you have an instinct that yeah. it's probably wrong. Matt, kind of get a bit frustrating. You did bring up how becoming a parent has changed you. Let me, let me just um, add more to that. How much has become, has becoming a parent changed your chess playing style? And for this question, let's introduce some control variables. So let's assume that time is not a factor. Let's assume that you have the same amount of time now to play chess as you did uh, before you had kids, because it's a hypothetical scenario. Right. Let's also introduce financial status as a control variable. Let's assume there's no responsibilities. And I'm also going to introduce a controversial con control variable, which is priorities. I'm going to say that chess still means as much to you now with kids as it did before kids. What I'm trying to get at is, is there something intrinsic about becoming a parent that changes you or changes your personality in such a way that it changes your chess playing style? I mean, let's not talk about whether it makes you better or worse, but does it just change you? Let's just start with that. Yeah, I, I'm. If you controlled for all those other variables, I'm guessing maybe not. It's it's okay. really it's just that you're you might be more aware of those other variables, yeah. and uh, I would say that. But if if you removed all that other stuff, it's more sort of general aging would be the issue, which often comes along with parenting, but is not as but doesn't make parenting sort of the root cause. Okay, so there's nothing intrinsic about becoming because you notice that many people when they have kids they become uh, more calculative or more maybe defensive, not the word, but let's say. Uh, more careful, more serious, more mature. These are the words that are thrown around conventional parenting traits. Do they not translate in chess that maybe you become more defensive player because in life you have now started to become slightly more calculated? Yeah, this- yeah, I'm not sure because um, because one, I don't get to play competitively that often. Maybe six times a year I go to a tournament and, and you know, you, you turn your phone off because of cheating issues. You, um, you can't have it even on your person when you play. Um, so it's a really a way for me to sort of disconnect from the world. And what I notice when I do get to do that, especially because I didn't play competitively uh, through my 30s for the most part, I mostly was not playing competitive chess, even though at times I was involved in the chess world. But what I notice is sort of how little I, how engulfing the game still is and how little I think about sort of my family life and my outside interests. Yeah. So, so that makes me think that it's not the biggest factor. Now, of course, I was also a professional poker player and I've uh, dabbled in that um, as an amateur in subsequent years. I played professionally for seven years, but in later years, for there was a period where I was still trying to make money at it, playing decent stakes, but going like once a week and that because there's directly money involved. Yeah. Unlike chess, that was one where I did notice being a parent makes me more risk averse. I mean, sorry. Yeah. More yeah, risk averse. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. So less inclined to bluff. And there often are situations where you should be bluffing. Yeah. So I actually found it a hindrance in poker. And again, that might've been something where, because I was playing once a week, which for a professional is not a lot, um, maybe you place undue weight on it as you, as you would, if you're playing more often, but I actually noticed it more in poker because in poker, there's a lot of downtime. You're in the casino, the TVs are on, you're checking your phone. So it's not this pure escapism. Whereas when you play chess, you're, you're so focused that it's like, you know, since I played a lot of competitive chess, like in my teens, it's like, 
I might forget that I'm not 18, you know, when I'm sitting there playing a game and that would never happen in poker. In when you're playing poker, it's probably your reptilian brain at work where it's like you've you're not completely switched off. The phone's on, the TV's yeah. on, a lot of distractions around you. So your gut instinct is to go through towards the parenting traits of right. being risk averse, being defensive. But in chess, because you're so focused, you're into the zone that it probably doesn't arise because you're that focused. Around yeah. It. Yeah. That's very interesting. Jonathan Rosson, who, yeah. who you interviewed on your podcast as well, described this feeling of this clarity you get when you're playing chess, where... People seem to assume that it gets very stressful for many good players. In fact, it's the clearest point that they've been in there. Yeah, the and joy you, of concentration. Exactly. Wrote, yeah. In other fields, in music, in art, they call it the flow state. Yeah, exactly. Is this a feeling that you experience as well when you play chess? Absolutely, yeah. And okay. it's, and you know, I've been an avid reader for most of my life. But these days when I read, I'm checking my phone all the time. So for me, it's almost like the last pure escape. Um, and when I play, I'm often at the end of the day, not super happy with how I play, you know, I, I wish I made some different moves, but you still get the same feeling at least. So you might be upset at the end of the game that you did something wrong, but at least when I'm sitting there thinking my mind's not wandering all over the place, I am uh, engulfed in the game, which as, as Rousen eloquently wrote in his book, The Moves That Matter, that's one of the, the most beautiful things about competitive chess. It goes against the grain because when I look at chess players, I get the feeling they're so stressed. The way they, the way they hold their head, yeah, like, yeah. what a stressful game. But the way it was described by him in his book and the way you've described it as well, it seems like it's more of a meditative experience. And well, it's both. Yeah, yeah, it's both at the same time, curiously enough. Yeah, very interesting. It's like a contrasting experience. But I do, but I do understand or I can resonate with the fact that when you're just concentrating on one thing and you've, you put the blinkers on, you've eliminated all of the noise from your life, it can be a moment of clarity. Yeah. And that can be a feeling that you want to chase. For me, it's always frustrating because I'm always, right. <laughs> always losing. But yeah, but that's a very interesting thing that you pointed out. Let's bring priority back into this discussion. We had kept priorities aside. Do you think after having kids, now that you have a realignment of priorities, it makes you a better or worse player? Because maybe chess doesn't mean as much to you. You may, might be playing more freely or you might be playing more recklessly because chess doesn't mean as much to you. So I don't think it matters that much at the board, but I do think it gives you better perspective. Um, so, okay. uh, but, but for a professional, that might not be the best thing for everyone else. It's great. Like I, I, the, even though I said, like when I compete, I don't think about my family that much, but I do have to remind myself if you're like trying to move faster, that no one cares, you know, how, if you win or lose, if you're not a professional yeah. and in particular, <laughs> your kids don't care, you know, like right. they, they are still going to love you either way. But if you're actually a professional, like you, you want that edge, you know, you, you want to think people care. Um, so it might be different at that level, but below the professional level, um, I think it's nice to have the results of your game in a proper perspective. And I think having kids helps with that. You also brought poker into the picture. So I'm going to ask you a question about poker as well. Do you think there are transferable skills between chess and poker? Do you get the feeling that do completely different games given the luck factor involved in poker as well? Yeah. I mean, I can speak to it more from the going uh, from chess to poker perspective because I was already a chess master and had a lot of experience in chess when I started with poker. And I have a lot of friends who are also chess players who had success in poker. And I think in that regard, it was definitely helpful because um, you you knew there were no shortcuts. Uh, you knew that in order to excel at a game, you needed to put in the work. You needed to be honest with yourself about your results. Um, so in poker, I think especially because um, it's it's a wicked environment, you get feedback that isn't necessarily accurate because you might make a good decision but get a bad result. Yeah. So I think for someone who doesn't have that some sort of competitive background, you can you can look past the mistakes that you're invariably making and just sort of chalk it up to bad luck. And in chess, you don't necessarily have that inkling, but if you're going from chess to poker with like, I mean, sorry, from poker to chess, chess. and a lot of uh, poker players have gotten into chess. Um, I'd say if you're an elite poker player, you're going to have a leg up in the chess world because you for sure sorted through that stuff um, and okay. learned how to excel at a game and study at a game. But if you're just like, a sort of local winner in a small stakes game and you've just sort of been able to 
out, you know, to outplay your opponents, but not necessarily at a super high level in poker. I'm not as sure that it would help you in chess because in chess, more than poker, you really have to study. Like there's no getting around it, you know. Um, Is there any role that luck plays in chess? Yeah, it's a bit, uh, it's a lot more subtle than poker. Okay. Um, but I would say there is a small role that it can play just mainly in terms of like what opening you might end up in a different game. Like, did it happen to be an opening that you studied in the previous okay. week or not? So stuff like that, you could say luck plays a role um, just in terms of who you get matched up against, whether they're having a bad day or not, that sort of thing. But but I mean, it's obviously way less than than poker. And, uh, you know, some people say there's no luck in chess. But I mean, to me, there are subtle luck factors. What do you prefer? Because you were also into stocks. You used to invest yeah. a lot and you were a professional poker player. And of course, you played chess. All three have an interesting relationship with luck. Chess, probably the most minimal. You can argue poker has the highest and maybe stocks somewhere in the middle. But that, yeah. maybe, maybe that argument can be flipped around. What do you prefer? Do you prefer to have a luck element in the game because it can it brings a certain thrill to it? Or do you prefer to be completely in control of what you're doing? Uh, I like the control that you get from chess, but I will say that if you've made if you've achieved something in poker, if you've become a successful poker player for a period, the the lessons that it teaches you about dealing with luck and variance are invaluable or, you know, because you just you stop taking for granted like all the the little things that make a difference in how someone's life turns out. So in that respect, uh, poker it teaches valuable lessons. So every chess player should play any game that would teach them how to deal with luck. Because well, it's not chess players in particular. I just think yeah. a, a lot of like there's there's got to be a way for high school kids to learn to assess probabilities better than they do. Yeah. And Poker, I'm not sure if high school kids should be introduced to it because the whole losing money thing, they don't necessarily <laughs> yeah. have the emotional maturity. Um, but if you sort of, if you pass through the ringer and learn the skills that a poker professional, a successful one will have learned, you will have learned very valuable life skills. But not everyone's going to pass through. Some people are just going to get so frustrated and sort of flame out and lose money, which yep. is not a good thing. Maybe destroy relationships. So I'm not saying it's <laughs> invariably a good thing, but I'm saying if you can sort of crawl through that tunnel and from the Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> then, 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 you'll, like the yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you'll come out okay. Very interesting. I'm, I'm sure there are other games as well that you can use to teach about luck. Mm -hmm. um, I personally used to... Not, not that I hate them, but you grew up playing games like Monopoly. Right. Um, most games have some luck elements. Scrabble, all these ones, Catan. And I used to have a slight distaste for the ones because there are times where you feel like you're playing the perfect game. Right. And there's a roll of dice that happens yeah. and that ruins your game entirely. Yeah, right? yeah. And no one will know that yeah. you have the strategy. But that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. experiencing that over and over again, it, like it's it a good lesson. That's yeah. true. I completely agree with you. Okay. Uh, we took this pretty interesting digression while we're talking about psychology, but I also want to check with you, what role does the cultural upbringing play in uh, making you gravitate towards chess? And why I say this, because there are certain regions in the world, Russia is a historical example. In recent times, India and China have seen a surge in popularity in chess. Armenia, Azerbaijan, you have certain countries that have a history with chess. Do you think it's, have you been able to pinpoint certain elements of the culture that make them gravitate towards chess? Or do you think it's more of, luck, circumstances, maybe a monarch who liked chess and became famous or there was a famous charismatic chess player and because of that became a cult of personality? Or do you think there's something about the culture itself that makes them, that makes chess so appealing? Um, yeah, I think predominantly it's just sort of, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once, once there's sort of a groundswell of interest, it's sort yeah. of the, the momentum building from there. But there does seem to be Within some cultures, like you mentioned, uh, China, Chinese and Indian um, as sort of two of the chess powerhouses. Now, there does seem to be a an often like an ambitious streak um, where that ambition is often channeled into chess in recent years. And uh, um, anyone who's taught scholastic chess, as I have, will notice that there's it seems like there's a even within the United States, which is not uh, which is obviously not a predominantly Indian and Chinese culture. 
you'll notice within the Chinese and Indian communities, there's yeah. uh, more kids being introduced to chess. So there is something there in terms of like, um, you know, what you might consider a cerebral activity yeah. or like a, a good activity for development where they're being pushed into it. But in terms of like the countries where this there's this sort of institutional history, I think it's more just sort of a gradual buildup or certain decision makers pushing things in that direction. Obviously, you mentioned Armenia. It's one of the few places in the world where they have chess paid for by the government and school programs. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's a former Soviet republic where they had uh, like the Palace of Pioneers where free chess instruction was provided to everyone along with other activities. But so... Um, often it's just the, the people making the decisions, pushing it, and then other people seeing the value in it building from there. Within the Indian culture, there's a strong focus on math and science. Right. And chess is viewed as this one game that does use a lot of analysis. And if you can get good at chess, it would imply that your kid is intelligent. Right. And that's the line to set them down the path for becoming an engineer. Right. <laughs> that's right. So I, I do see that. I, I, I mean, I saw that fascination in my house itself. Uh, my dad only taught us one game and that was chess. Right. Like, there you yeah, go. Yeah. yeah. There's no other sport that they yeah. taught us. So that's pretty, pretty interesting. Let's talk about your rating. So. No, please don't. <laughs> it only goes down. <laughs> you have set for, set this goal for yourself where you want to now achieve your peak rating of 2270, I believe. I would like to get halfway back there. So for, <laughs> for anyone watching or listening, um, to, yeah, that, that makes you even a low level master. And now my rating is down a little bit below 2100, which is the lowest it's been in years. So yeah, I would like to get back to 2200. Um, but there's a lot going on in the chess world. Uh, the, the, in addition to the, the strong engines that we mentioned, there's just tons of learning tools and, uh, people can, you, you know, in order to get good at chess, you used to be able to, you used to have to find games. Mm -hmm. And now the fact that people can play 24 hours a day, play against world-class players in the form of engines 24 hours a day, uh, sites like chess.com and Lee Chess have these algorithms that as soon as you play a game, you click a button and it shows you your biggest mistakes. Yeah. Uh, chess players used to have to spend hours trying to figure out what they did wrong in a chess game. They used to have to write down the moves themselves and then try to play through it, try to find someone to show you what you did wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, the learning curve has been accelerated greatly and most of those spoils getting back to our prior conversation, unfortunately, a lot of the spoils go to the younger players with more yep. time. So it's, it's an uphill climb. I would love to, uh, to, um, regain some of my prior rating points, but, um, it's, it's challenging. And, you know, I encourage my listeners on the perpetual chess podcast as amateurs, to find something beyond rating to measure themselves yeah. by. So I try to live up to that too. And what we were getting back to about the beauty of concentration, stuff like that, like that to me is more important than, than the beauty is more important than the results. We started exactly. the concept, I look yeah. at you. Yeah. <laughs> we have come to a conclusion, but the reason I brought up your rating was, uh, well, firstly, I think you're too harsh on yourself. <laughs> 2100, I think already in the top 5% of the world and right. already the, far smarter in this room <laughs> than River Fast. But the reason I brought it up is because you've set this goal for yourself. I wanted to get an idea into how you would dissect a routine that will get you to that goal. So let's assume that you have all the time in the world, financial constraints are taken out, all your priorities have been taken out. Let's say tomorrow you start a fight camp or like a training camp to get that rating. How would you divide your time? How many hours would you spend in each day and what would you be doing in all those hours? Yeah. So I'm writing a book about getting better at chess, trying to sort of uh, um, compile all the knowledge that's been shared with the people that I've interviewed. And one of my recent interviews, someone said something that really interviewed with me. It was really resonated with me. Sorry. It was um, international master Willie Hendricks, who's wrote some groundbreaking books. And he basically said quantity is quality, in his opinion, when I asked him what his uh, philosophy of chess improvement is. And that really crystallized something that I'm taking a lot more words to say in my book. Um, so I, I really think that there is there is no substitute for just many hours. So I, I honestly think the, the challenge that I described, if you removed all of those constraints, um, it wouldn't be that hard for me because I'm not trying to become a world class player. You know, I'm trying to reach roughly a level that I've already been to yeah. um, now what we said about crystallized intelligence still applies. So maybe mm -hmm. I couldn't be quite as good, but I think I could be in the ballpark. And honestly, I think as long as you're not like playing what's called bullet chess, where you're just instantly moving and not thinking and not looking at your games at all. I think as long as you're trying hard and doing some form of uh, deliberate practice, you know, 
where you are grading your results and looking to learn from your mistakes. I think that it could be doing chess puzzles, like studying. Yeah. It could, but the number one thing um, is, in my opinion, there's no substitute for actually competing. Um, this is something I talk about uh, also in my book. I mean, I've uh, we mentioned the Lex Friedman podcast earlier. I'm also a fan of the the Huberman Lab, and he talks Trust. about, yeah. um, you know, um, he gives some tips for generating neuroplasticity in yeah. adults. You know, and Trust. he describes wanting to have a novel environment, like in yeah. order for as an experience, it gets more challenging to assimilate new patterns as you get older. Um, but if you do things in a novel environment, then the lessons are more likely to stick. And to me. Uh, again, I'm revealing things that I'm going to be talking about in the book, but um, that really crystallized to me why I noticed that amongst the amateurs I interview, the ones who are, and I, I do this series called the Adult Improver Series, mm -hmm. where I interview outliers. I interview the exceptions to the rule of adults really struggling after a certain point to get better at chess. And what I've noticed is a lot of the ones who do succeed, it's because they're competing all the time. So it's not just study. You know, chess at the end of the day is a game of decision making with a time, with a clock, you know, so you've got to learn to navigate that situation and manage your time well and uh, calculate the sort of risk reward ratio of thinking as opposed to moving. Um, and there's no substitute for just doing that over and over again and then getting the feedback of the result and the quality of the choices you made. So if uh, if I had like an unlimited budget and, you know, unlimited time, I would I would have a good coach, which which I do. Um, but I would mainly just be competing a ton. Um, and I think that would be the best bang for your buck um, work you could do. But beyond that, it's chess puzzles. Putting the reps in like a gym. A lot of comedians talk about how many people stress being naturally funny, but it's all about just putting in the reps at an open mic. and just That's a great analogy. Yeah. yeah you've got to be on the stage. You, you know? have to be on the stage. Yeah. You get the feedback and then you change your style. Then you come back again on stage and change it. It's an yeah. iterative process. And this is what Alpha Zero and Alpha Go do as well. So yeah. interesting that you've got the path laid down. Let's assume one year down the line, you reach 20 to 70. How are you going to celebrate? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but that's, that's the other thing is, I mean, it's like all the, the studies about like the hedonic treadmill and people, yep. when they achieve something, <laughs> they just want something more. Yep. So I, I'm sure I would be thinking about 2,300, 20, 2,400 right away. Close. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think about it for one day and it would be over, you know? Oh, that's great that you're aware of the hedonic treadmill <laughs> yeah. that you're already on. I'm sure you can plan a big celebration if you do reach 20 to 70. It, it is a major achievement. Um, as it is reaching anywhere above 2000, I think you already, uh, worth the respect. Oh, well, him. thank you. <laughs> you mentioned bullet chess. We spoke a lot about intelligence. How do you view bullet chess and blitz blitz games? How much of a role does intelligence play and how much of a role does subconscious gut instinct or just, just having an understanding of the game? Cause it, I get the feeling you don't even have the time to process the moves you're playing. Yeah. I think a lot of it does come down to pattern recognition. Um, okay. so yeah, I mean, I, that and speed, just sheer speed. I mean, there's this yeah. this grandmaster, Andrew Tang, who I've gotten to interview, who's just mind bogglingly fat penguin GM. He, he used to do a lot of Twitch streaming. But speaking of finance, now he's going to be working for uh, Susquehanna in the finance space because got one of the fastest minds in the world, you know, so uh, they, they uh, rightfully um, made him an offer he couldn't refuse. But um, <laughs> but. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's some combination of instinct and speed and just sheer processing power, especially someone like that who's at an elite level playing with uh, Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Faruja and, and people like that. How do you prepare for it com compared to normal classical chess? Like, is that different? Or do you just prepare as you do normally and you hope your instinct builds subconsciously? Yeah, it's interesting. I interviewed Grandmaster Daniel Neroditsky, who, of course, is a famous chess content creator, yep. um, was one of the best players. I mean, he's a Grandmaster, so obviously, um, you know, he's been world-class for his age at various times, but now he focuses more on his content. But bullet chess, one-minute chess, is the one area of chess where he's top 10 in the world uh, to this day, even though he doesn't necessarily play slow chess as much anymore. But when I interviewed him, he said something that I found fascinating, getting to your point, which is he said if he wanted to get better at bullet chess, because where he is now is absolutely amazing. If he he's, he's played matches with Magnus where he'll play hundreds of games and he might win 30% of them, which is just like incredible, especially because he's 
obviously, again, an amazing player, but not on Magnus's level in the other forms of chess. But he said if he wanted to get better at the fastest forms of chess, he would have to get better at the slower forms of chess. There's no substitute. Yeah, at least at his level. Uh, at my level, I think if I wanted to get better at one minute chess, the best things for me to do would be there's this game called Puzzle Rush that chess.com has, which is just how quickly you spot tactics, do a ton of that and play a bunch of one minute chess. So after a certain threshold, you have to get the foundation right or the fundamentals right. And that should seep into your subconscious. That's what Daniel, Daniel said. And far be it from me to argue with him. So even though I argued with Kasparov earlier. <laughs> yeah, I do love the way he breaks down games. I think He's his, amazing. His commentary yeah. is something that I can actually follow as someone who doesn't follow chess that yeah. often. It's a very great way of um, describing the game. Okay, let's go from one grandmaster to another. You interviewed Vishwanathan Anand. Yes, the legend. The legend himself. And there's one interesting thing he said on your episode was that on the Perpetual Chess Podcast, where he said that when he sat down to play over the board, so many more questions and problems came into his mind compared to when he played online. What do you think it is about playing over the board that stimulates you so much more mentally? Or do you think this is more of a generation gap problem? No, it's definitely not a generational gap. And I'm glad that you mentioned that quote because that was the one that resonated with me the most in that interview where, um, because um, someone had submitted a question saying, how do you deal with nerves? And he said, even when he sits down to play at a game, he said he feels abject terror. And, <laughs> and the, question, the question was framed because he's known for looking really cool under yeah. pressure, you know? He looks like he doesn't have a care in the world, but he said that that he's just as nervous as everyone else. And yeah, I don't think there's there again, that gets to, to what I was saying about Andrew Huberman's advice about there being real stakes. When you sit down and I, I've experienced this, obviously, at a much lower level, but you think you've memorized your opening sequence um, and then you go to play in something that if and someone plays it against you in a casual uh, speed chess game online and you just play the move you just trust your instinct but then when you travel to go play in this tournament leave your family pay your money you know yeah. you're going to be sitting at this game for five hours you face the exact same move and you feel like am i sure this is the move and then you just sort of go in this cycle they call it seeing ghosts where you're scared of some move that you never even thought about <laughs> when you had less yeah. time and that was the exact phenomenon that anand described and it was Interesting to hear him say it because that's certainly something any amateur experiences almost like every time they sit down to play. But it was interesting that even um, one of the best players of all time also experiences that. This is a debate that we're getting into in every single profession, every field, because the digital world is taking over. Mm -hmm. And the argument that they make over the real experience, the physical experience versus what you experience in the digital world is is something that I, that you see everywhere. Um, most people getting to chess now are going to be getting in through online chess. Chess streaming has become a genre of its own. Many chess streamers have become celebrities in their own regard. Do you think they're missing out? When Because I feel like over, over time and as more young people get into chess through online chess, they're going to probably, maybe the over the board section becomes more of a classical, becomes a museum of what it used to right. be. Do you think they will be missing out on a certain aspect of chess? Maybe the social aspect of it? Yeah, it's possible. My general advice is to at least try over the board chess, but uh, it's nerve wracking. It can be expensive. Um, so I, I'm not someone who says if you try it and you don't enjoy it, like keep doing it, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I do think that it activates certain senses and sort of arouses um, a heightened emotion that you may not ever feel playing chess if you don't try it. But that doesn't mean you'll like it. A lot of people just find it to be too intense and find the the um, the juice not to be worth the squeeze. It's just too much work, uh, diminishing returns, so on and so forth. And I think that's a valid opinion to form, but you should try it and make make that decision on your own. What about another, I would classify as a genre. Let's start with who are the chess hustlers of New York City? How would you describe them? Oh, funny. I was in Washington <laughs> Square Park today. I did yeah. a perpetual chess interview from there earlier. Um, I mean, I'm, I used to live in New York, so I used to, on a nice day, if I didn't have anything to do, I might just go over there and try to find a few games to play. I haven't done that in a long time, but, uh, but they're, they're a lot of fun to play. And I know a lot of creators like to, to make videos playing them when they pass through a town, Alexandra Botez and, yeah. uh, Anna Cromling and so on. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, there's definitely, and of course there was this famous video that Maurice Ashley, Grandmaster Maurice Ashley did with Tim Ferriss where he, they didn't know who he was and he played uh, one of the hustlers. So yeah, they've got their own bag of tricks. You've got to be careful, (laughs) but basically you shouldn't play them to make money. You know, it's, it's, they're providing a service by being there anytime with their own chess pieces to play. And hopefully you'll have a good game if you play them, but uh, you're not getting rich being a chess hustler in one of the parks. So if you play them, um, Hopefully it's mostly for the experience. Would you classify that as a separate genre altogether where it's not classical chess, there's a more theatrical element to it. There's maybe a larger component of trash talking, intimidation, heckling. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And Do you I, think it's a mutation of classical chess? Like, is, is, I guess in a way it's a difference between professional wrestling and WWE and what's become right. right? Would, you, would you classify it the same way? Yeah, I would say it, it, it's similar. I mean, but there is a fine line between like, trash talking and then there's things that are actually cheating and you've got to, you know, you've got to be careful about (laughs) like, you know, someone moving up, like there's all kinds of tricks people can do, like touching the clock by accident so that it switches whose clock is running or moving a piece to a different square when you're both really low on time. Um, So there's all kinds of dirty tricks that people can try, but just, (laughs) just playing a game in a physical chess set uh, in real life in a park and talking tons of trash, it's fair game. And it's certainly like, the ability to do that is its own skill. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's fair game. That is a great video, the one with Maurice Ashley, because he catches the hustler. Yeah, cheating. exactly. Because <laughs> Maurice is, a, you know, he came up that way. So exactly. he's, he's seen it all. Yeah, definitely a great video. I recommend everyone to try out. We are approaching the end of our middle game. Before we move to the end game, I have a blitz round for you. Okay. But this is not a blitz game that you're used to playing. In this section, I'm going to only give you one minute to answer the question and okay. let's see if you can make a case for the question in a minute. Are you ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. In a minute or less, can you make the case that Bobby Fischer was the greatest chess player of all time? Go. It wouldn't be my, it wouldn't be my pick, but I can definitely make the case. Yeah. Uh, he probably, at least when chess ratings existed, he had the widest golf between him and the second best player in the world. So there, that's a pretty solid case, even though it's, again, it's not who would be my pick because the knock against him is his peak was much shorter than yeah. Kasparov and Carlson, who are the other two. Those three are named that most often as the possible best players of all time. Okay. So if you were to make the case for Bobby Fischer, it would be the variance between him or the gulf or the delta between him and all the other chess players. Yeah, he was at his peak. Yeah. Ahead big, of its time. Yeah. Okay. You made the case for Bobby Fischer. You know where I'm going next. In a minute or less, can you make the case that Gary Kasparov was the greatest chess player of all time? For sure. I mean, he, he, it was the, the length of his, um, the length of his reign. Yeah. I mean, to defend his title, uh, so many times against Karpov, who was one of the best players of all time in his own right, but just to find a way to win. Um, and the other thing is I, you know, I've interviewed people who played him and he had an intimidation factor that you don't hear about even, even compared to like Magnus Carlsen. Right. Um, he, you know, he, sort of domineering personality. Uh, Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan famously described him as being like a caged animal when you played him. You could just sort of feel the life force and the energy. And his opening preparation was leaps and bounds ahead of his competition. He had some sort of institutional advantages because at that time there weren't as many successful chess professionals. So he was able to build a team that would be hard to replicate. Mm -hmm. But it's not hard to make the case for Kasparov as the the GOAT. (laughs) Okay, one minute up. So for Kasparov, it's going to be the longevity in the game, the preparation and the intimidation factor as well, and the kind of feeling he created in his opponents as well. So you've made the case for Fisher in terms of the Delta. For Kasparov, it's the longevity in the game. Final one. (laughs) <laughs> one minute or less, can you make the case that Magnus Carlsen is the greatest chess player of all time? Of course, and he comes down somewhere in between. But one thing you have to mention with Magnus that is less clear with Kasparov and Fischer, but might have been true, is now we do know that he's better at all forms of chess. You know, he's he's been the best bullet player yeah. when he bothers to play online, been the best blitz player, won the FIDE World Rapid and Blitz, which was a tournament that didn't exist in uh, Fischer and Kasparov's heyday. Um, he hasn't, in terms of rating golf, he hasn't been quite as dominant as Fisher, but he has been the number one player uninterrupted since 2012 or so. So that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, He's also, he hasn't, again, he didn't have quite the golf, but for the most part, no one has been near him. There was a period where Caruana got within a few points of of, uh, eclipsing his rating. Funny enough, it was around the time that he beat uh, Caruana in the world championship. Um, So I think with Carlson, um, 
if he can maintain his number one ranking, it might take a few more years for him to, uh, to, to me, Kasparov is number one. Fisher is third because his peak was so short. Um, and Carlson is, I would say, supplanting Kasparov is well within his sights, but a few more years at the top wouldn't hurt. So Carlson's argument would be the versatility that he's shown in the different formats and the universal style of play. But even though his, he's probably not been not been in the game as long as Kasparov and he doesn't have that much of a gulf as Fisher. Yeah. Right? And it's interesting because and you have these in all sports where you can make the, there's always an if, what if, right, right. what if Fisher had played longer, he already had that gulf. What if he had been a champion for the next 10, 15 years? It's easy to imagine he would have been because it's such a big yeah. difference. But because he didn't, you can't make that case. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Tough to do. I think you have aced these three questions. Fourth one, in a minute or less, you have... Many different chess variants. You have one where there's no casting allowed. There's one where the pawns can move diagonal. There's a self-capture version as well. What's one rule that you feel that if it was introduced into the classical chess board would make the game a lot more interesting if you had to make the case in one minute? Yeah, well, it's funny you should mention the no castling version because that uh, Kramnik uh, in his retirement from competitive chess actually uh, consulted, I think it was with Google, um, use some of the same methodology they use for the Alpha Zero program to sort of run simulations on a bunch of different rule tweaks to see what makes chess like a less yeah. opening dependent, more pure right. game. And he came up with, I mean, not him personally, but yeah. they walked away and said it's no castling chess because um, the, the ability to hide your king in the corner in a single yeah. move uh, just um, increases the draw percentage greatly. Yeah. So I, I would say that, that that is some relatively low hanging fruit but all these, you know, it's just tough. We, you know, this game has been around in its current form for, you know, 400 years or something. And obviously in slightly different forms for like 15, 1600 years. So any change is going to encounter massive resistance. So <laughs> that's why I still say first and foremost, speed the games up. And, uh, okay. but again, not everyone will agree. I understand. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting hate mail regardless <laughs> yeah, exactly. from a lot of people, Kasparov included. Okay. So you made the case for no casting chess. Final question, the blitz round. What is a new chess piece if it was added to the classical board that could move differently? Whether it would replace a piece or whether it would just be added to the board that you think would make the game much richer? Wow, I have never thought about that. But I mean, again, having been a former scholastic teacher and seeing how kids react to the night, uh, in particular, they love the fact that it looks like an animal. Um, and again, the fact that it can jump. I think maybe some sort of super night might be fun where instead of it going one, two in turn, yeah. it could go like one, two, three, four, five in turn. So wow. it can just sort of fly across the board. <laughs> I think that that might spice up the game. A Sounds bit. like a super powerful piece. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would love to see the super night. Excellent performance in the blitz round. This is better than any blitz game Hikaru Nakamura has ever wow. played in this life. Hypers. Five out of five for you. Before we move into the end game, I would love it if you can interpret what masterpiece you've been building with the Lego. This is, this is a rock. <laughs> it goes up and down and side to side. <laughs> <laughs> Easy as most things should be. Right. What do you think this monstrosity wow, is? I don't know what that is. I don't know what you have there. <laughs> yeah. If you had to take a guess, what do you think that is? Uh, it looks like some sort of this, you know, they used to call the rook a castle. This kind of looks like some sort of lair, you know, with like a moat going in. That That's all I got. That's exactly what I was building. <laughs> nice. A castle for the rook. They okay. all die in perfectly. This is art. This, <laughs> yes, exactly. this is Kasparov in Lego form. Okay. Time for the end game. Okay. Some final moves. What are some books, movies, role models that have strongly influenced in your life? Wow. Um, yeah, I could go a lot of directions. Uh, <laughs> are we talking chess books, non-chess books? Let's keep it non-chess because you've spoken so much about chess. Okay. So, so one of my favorite books in recent years was, I, I really like this reporter, Derek Thompson. He writes for The Atlantic and now he has a podcast too um, called Plain English. Um, but he's just one of, seems to be one of the smartest people in the world. But he wrote a book called Hit Makers a few years ago, basically about like what makes something popular. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a book that really resonated with me. I mean, uh, one of the ideas is um, basically you want things to be familiar, but different. So you, you take some, you take a common idea, but you put some sort of twist on it. And that seems to lead it. I mean, he, he talks about music. He looks at uh, other forms of art, uh, movies and so on and so forth. Um, so that, that was a book that I really enjoyed um, in terms of movies. My wife and I, we don't watch movies now that we have kids. We watch shows. I mean, we enjoy uh, Succession. It's spectacular. We're, we're enjoying the uh, final season so far. The Wire is my favorite TV show. 
ever. I can kind of gravitate towards a lot of the typical air quotes, prestige shows. Um, but yeah, um, let's see. Um, nonfiction. I, uh, if I take a minute, I'm sure I'll think of some more. I'm still reading fairly frequently. Um, why you think of those role models as well? Uh, which role models? Non-chess role models in your life that have oh. strongly inspired you. Let's see. Um, well, I love to look at, as a content creator, I love to look at uh, other content creators. So I've never been a golf fan remotely. I've never been <laughs> remotely interested. But I saw someone tweet about this golf podcast called No Laying Up. So I started just checking it out just sort of as a content creator. And they they do a really good job of sort of building community. And they're doing like, they're in different verticals. They're writing. They're, uh, they're doing recaps of big golf tournaments as they happen. They're interviewing top players. Um, and they're very entertaining. They're extremely knowledgeable. So that's someone who, again, it's funny because when I watch, if I try to watch golf, which I would only do now because I listen to their podcast, I don't know the terminology. I don't know what's going on, but it's one of these things where just the enthusiasm that they exude pulls me in and makes me want to learn more. So that that's definitely one as someone who's in a, who's pr promoting another niche activity, <laughs> um, that that's something that I try to learn from. If all the books in the world were erased, destroyed, the loss of which one chess book would be the greatest loss in the world? Wow, that is a tough question. Um, it's the end game. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's funny because the first book I thought of is one that I often um, sort of talk people away from on uh, the podcast. It's one called My Great Predecessors. And I recently collaborated with uh, some friends of mine uh, who run this uh, chess learning site called Chess Dojo, where we talked about our favorite chess books of all time. And Kostya Kovutsky, uh, international master, recommended Gary Kaspar's famous series, My Great Predecessors. And I was criticizing it just because it was written in the 2000s and Kasparov does a lot of engine analysis, but it's this five volume, five or six, somewhere around their volume series that, I mean, the title is pretty self-explanatory. It looks at all of the great chess players, the world champions in particular of all time, and sort of walks through their careers and talks about what uh, what separates them from other players. Yeah. Um, and it's, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's a very, very well-selling book. Um, and I do think that if you just wanted to learn a wide scope of chess history in one series, although it is five or six books, so it's cheating a little bit, but it would be a big loss if it weren't there, even though I've already said because of my stylistic preferences of how many computer lines are in it, it it's it's not one of the books I recommend the most. Interesting, right? It's not a book that you recommend, but if there was one book that you had to save, it would probably be. Yeah, it, because book. put it like this, it is one of the most recommended books on my podcast. So right. like that, you know, I'm just one person. And the wisdom of crowds definitely uh, gives it a high mark. So <laughs> well, glad you thought about the world at large, <laughs> right. not just your own purpose, personal preference. Love that answer. Ben Johnson had once said that music and chess are the great connectors. Who do you think was the greatest connector in music? Who do you think brought the world together with just their music? Hmm. Well, the first that come to mind are the Beatles and Bob Marley, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, the Beatles, it's obviously... Why? Yeah. Um, just the the sheer power and magnitude. I lived in St. Petersburg in Russia uh, in 1998. I did a semester abroad there when I was in college. And yeah, even there where English was not their native language, you heard so many people say that they loved the Beatles. Um, so I, I think, yeah. And they, again, speaking of ahead of their time and the sort of uh, width of the type of music, the type of rock that they created, but um yeah, that, that's the first thing that comes to mind. And Bob Marley is more about the sort of messages of unity, I guess. Beatles because of the width of the music. Yeah. And Bob Marley because of the messaging. Last two moves. What would you like your legacy to be like? Check. Wow. I, I, and check. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not expect to have a legacy. That would be a pleasant surprise if I, <laughs> if I had one. But certainly the, the goal of my podcast is I just, I just like to tell stories through chess. And uh, the, the, the reason that I founded it is I just found chess players to be interesting. I felt that they had fascinating stories to share. And obviously podcasting, I mean, it's still a young medium, but I started the podcast in 2016, even a bit younger then. Um, chess has a rich folklore. I mean, there's tons of 
funny stories that you'd hear if you go to a tournament that you wouldn't necessarily make their way to a book or if they did, they might not necessarily be a, as widely disseminated. So I love the, that people can share their stories of chess, which obviously hopefully has a broader impact beyond chess, you know? So um, that's why I enjoy interviewing both professionals and amateurs. So uh, I mean, legacy is a, a daunting word, but uh, hopefully I at least uh, um, helped to, helped people tell some good stories and sort of, uh, share the many different roles that a game can play in someone's life. If it's any comfort to you, I would put the perpetual chess podcast in the Mount Rushmore with full English breakfast in Thank the beginning, you. because you have a lot of chess podcasts now, but not many of them are centered around the theme of just pure passion for the game or just pure joy for it, which comes through in yours. Usually it's usually it's someone who already plays chess, who just, brings it out as a side hustle right or it's just some project to get some kind of attention cloud or something of that sort or they're already famous in a certain field and then the podcast is just like a side game right. that they do on the side but the perpetual chess podcast is i feel like a pure passion project i started off that way and you can the joy comes through well and thank you i appreciate yeah, that it's definitely a great podcast to listen to even if you're not into chess thanks that's that's what we're going for <laughs> that's the legacy yeah final move over the last two hours, we've spoken about psychology, about art, about chess, about it being a sport, a science. Final move for you. What do you think is the meaning of this all? What do you think is the meaning of life? Wow, ben, the, ben mean, the meaning of life. Um, I always quote my friend Donnie, who says, life is about the quality of your relationships. So okay. not, at the end of the day, nothing <laughs> else matters. It's, uh, are, you, you know, are you helping to, to make people, the people close to you uh, happier, you know, and that's really what it comes down to. I mean, obviously there's people in the world doing groundbreaking, saving lives. And the, we're so, we're so fortunate to have, uh, to, to have people doing those sorts of things, but on a much smaller scale, just as long as you're kind of pushing the ball forward and not being a net negative, I think, uh, that's all we can ask for. The meaning of life is the quality of relationships. Check mate. <laughs> <laughs> ben, thank you so much. If people want to connect with you, find out more about the perpetual chess podcast where can they do so yeah so i'm i don't know how long twitter is going to last i don't know if i'll be able to keep my <laughs> keep my account going there um but i have a so i i'm on twitter at beneficial one uh you can go to perpetualchesspod.com to, or check for it on any podcast app i've also started a newsletter um where once a week i send out the best chess articles that i've come across a lot of them are focused from amateurs on how to get their game uh, better well, as, as we talk about on perpetual chess, but um, also sort of anything going on in the chess world. Again, we're recording this right before the world championship starts. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to send that out every Friday and it's free and I won't share your email address. Um, so you can search for perpetual chess link fest or find it on Substack. So those are the best ways to keep up. Perpetual chess is the place to find it. Ben, it was a privilege talking to you. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, it was much. a lot of fun. Thank you.